All right, gang, here we go. This is Chem 2 Unit 5. We're talking about uh, hybridization and sigma versus pi bonds today. All right, so, so far we've talked about, uh, in Chapter 9, we've talked about uh, Vesper theory, and we talked about how um, we can use Vesper theory in order to predict molecular geometries. Okay, um, but Vesper theory does a really, really good job of predicting what will the molecule actually look like. However, it doesn't really describe how bonds are formed when you actually start making these or making these molecules. Okay, and so we're going to look today at what's called valence bond theory and hybridization, and then in the next video we'll talk about molecular orbital theory and just kind of barely skim the surface of that. All right, so valence bond theory, essentially what you're saying is that your bonding happens between valence electrons, and we know what the shapes of these orbitals the valence electrons are in, right? We've talked about S and P and D and F orbitals, and so we're going to be talking about, well, uh, under the valence bond theory, you're making the assumption that these electrons are still going to be located in these same sorts of orbitals, okay? And so when you make a, a bond, really what's happening is that these uh, orbitals are overlapping one another, and in this space that's being shared between the two of them right here this is where your bond actually occurs so when you two have two hydrogen atoms this is shared space this overlap is where that covalent bond occurs all right and then hydrochloric acid so the H has a 1s orbital and we know S's are spherical and chlorine is a P and that's your dumbbell shape like this and so this space in between here this spot right here that is where your uh, covalent bond happens again right there and then in chlorine you have this these three P's right and we know this is 3p because chlorine's on the third energy level and that's where its valence electrons are all right and so that's where your bond happens so that's essentially what we're looking at is like okay okay bonds happen when these orbitals will overlap one another and they have this shared space all right um, and this occurs primarily because and because of energy right remember when we talked about octet rule and we described octet rule as a sneezing tree right it doesn't really exist and so um, uh, it's all about energy so here's our energy curve, and you can see that at this bottom place, this ideal place of having a bond, this is where you're at the most optimum, lowest energy. Okay, And as your two nucleuses get closer to one another, as we go to the left on the x-axis here, uh, these nucleuses get closer to one another, they become more unstable as these protons, as these positive charges get closer and closer together. And then as they get farther and farther apart, there's less of a stabilizing effect of this bond. All right, so the, the most stable place is just right here. All right, so um, so that's the reason they make that, uh, why they uh, like sit in that specific bond length. And that's really the essence of why bond lengths are the way they are. Okay, um, <clears throat> now here's the problem with uh, just looking at specific, just valence shell and just running with this idea that they use this valence shell. So if we think about a water molecule, for example, Okay, um, we know, so water would be made of, uh, uh, so if we were just going to draw a water molecule like this, we know it's like this, right? And um, so it's going to be uh, a bent molecule, right? So, and that means this, this bond angle is based off tetrahedral, and remember these lone pairs take up extra space. So this is going to be a less than 109.5 degrees, okay? 109.5 degrees. So that's what Vesper says, and that, that matches very, very well against what uh, experimental data actually shows us what this bond angle is. However, it doesn't, uh, if we think about it purely as as, as valence um, electrons, life gets more uh, exciting, all right? Um, so if you were going to imagine, so these hydrogens, remember hydrogens uh, are these, you know, there's, there's your 1s from your hydrogen, and then your oxygen is on the second energy level. So oxygen is going to be forming bonds using the 2p orbital okay now so if you have your 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 uh, guy here and you're gonna to have to forgive my drawing here you kind of have imagined what's going on in 3d so there's there's one part of your 2p and there's the other part of your 2p all right and so this is your uh, 2p and we could say that's the 2p x we also know that there's 2p y that kind of comes up here like this right and then there's a 2p z that comes in and out of the plane like one part of the z is coming out at you and the other part of z is going into the screen okay and then 
this guy here, the other part it would be a 1s from your hydrogen right here, and this would be your other sphere. Okay, so that's your other 1s orbital. And so this is where your covalent bond occurs. Now, if you were just going to use this straight up, you would assume, well, okay, so this hydrogen, this oxygen here, right, is your, uh, or this nucleus right here, it's using this spot here uh, for these p orbitals, are the, they're going to be making those bonds, right? These p orbitals are going to be making these bonds with these 1s's. However, the problem is, is based on, you know that there's lone pairs, and well, there's there's really like one electron here. One, it doesn't matter. But anyway, so you have yeah, you have pairs here, and then you got pairs uh, coming in and out of the page. And so these guys are all going to repulse each one another. So really, you've got six lobes. You're right, you've got two, two, and two lobes. And so each of these lobes are going to be 90 degrees apart, right? And and this is what you would predict the bond angle would be with these two guys would be 90 degrees apart from one another. However, this doesn't really this isn't what matches at all with what we would assume or what based off of our uh, experimental data. OK, and all of this stuff is just uh, their way of saying exactly what we just explored here. If we look at oxygen, its electron configuration is this and it shares two electrons to fill its valence shell. They should be in the 2p. So that means they should have 90 degree angle but it's actually 104.5. And so really this is the reason why we have to come up with this new thing called hybrid orbitals or hybridization, okay? Hybrid orbitals are formed by mixing atomic orbitals, okay, to create new orbitals of equal energy called degenerate orbitals. And these are called, these is, this process is called hybridization, okay? And so what you're essentially doing is you're mixing orbitals Okay, in order to create a new type of orbital uh, that can be used for bonding. Okay, and this this new type of orbital is called a degenerate orbital. Okay, so essentially, the idea is that you're creating. So, like, say you've got uh, you've got your one s right, and we looked at something like this, and then you've got your two p, and it's something like this right. You got three bonds or three orbitals here for the p orbitals, and then these guys will all combine to form. And notice how I drew them at different levels. This shows that the one s is at. I guess it would be more accurate to say two s. Excuse me. So the two s would be at a lower energy level than the two p. And so essentially, what you're doing is you're forming a new hybrid orbital in which these two things are at equal levels. All right, they're at equal energy. Okay. <clears throat> so they and so uh, there's a couple of rules of thumbs that we can use when we're talking about this. Um, the first one here is that when these orbitals mix, they always keep the same number of orbitals. So if you're mixing two orbitals, you're going to create two hybrid orbitals. So if you mix three orbitals, you're going to get create three hybrid orbitals for, and so on and so forth. So that's an important thing to remember. So let's let's start with a simple uh, one here. If we look at beryllium. Okay, and we look at the orbital diagram for beryllium right here. So this is the orbital diagram for beryllium. It's got a full 1s and a full 2s. And we know, like, if we were going to make something like a beryllium chloride, BLCl2, BeCl2, it would look something like this. We'd have Be and then chlorine and then chlorine and then a bunch of lone pairs sticking on that chlorine, right? It would look like this. And beryllium is that funny guy who doesn't need to have a full octet, right? He's okay just having these two S filled and being a happy clam like that. All right, so we know he'll make these two bonds here like so. All right, so so based off of our valence understanding, okay, uh, without thinking about hybrid orbitals, we'd come up with well, we'd imagine the electrons are doing something like this. The uh, the shielding electron or the the electrons the inner electrons the shielding electrons would be these one s's and they're not going to change however these two s, this two s would split and one of them would be almost promoted to a 2p now that, that doesn't quite work that way all right they don't get promoted up to the 2p because it that means it takes energy and then you have to start asking yourself well, where does that energy come from that doesn't quite make sense so what what our current understanding is or based on the hybridization model is that we form this new hybridized orbital called an sp orbital. So notice that we've taken one the s from the 2s right here, this 2s guy, and one of the 2ps. And then we've combined them together to form one guy of an equal energy level. So if we were going to draw out the energy levels, it would look something like this. We'd have the 1s at the bottom because that's the lowest energy. And then we'd have like an sp here, sp, and then we'd have two more 2ps. And then 
<clears throat> so this would be the leftover two piece here. And the old guys that it came from, the other P would have been here, and the other S would have been down here somewhere, the other two S. But anyway, and so th this guy here in the middle doesn't really exist. This isn't, this isn't really what happens. This model explains a lot better what actually occurs, okay? Now, you might be asking yourself, what the heck does this new orbital look like? Well, it's a mixture of the two characteristics. And remember, they're called degenerate orbitals, okay? So the sp hybridized orbital has two lobes like the p orbital, but because of the s orbital, they're off center. That's kind of how I think about it. Okay, so <clears throat> um, so here's your your s and your p. So this is your sp. These two combine and hybridize to do these guys. So notice how you've got two lobes like the p. One of them is bigger and rounder, kind of more like an s, and the other one's kind of more dumbbell shaped. And then the other thing that you notice is that in a p orbital, you get a node right on the nucleus. Notice how there's absolutely no electron density right on the nucleus in the hybridized orbital though things get off center okay and you actually end up with the the a nucleus is actually a little bit inside of the smaller end of your lobe isn't that interesting so anyway so it's kind of a characteristic mix of both and then we can superimpose them on one another and we get this sp which looks very similar to the just the regular p but this is now we get that sp look all right so when beryllium we make something like bef2 which is very similar to bes2 that we were looking at before they this is what our new hybridized orbital would look like and we still get this overlap region of these valence electrons now, fluorine would just be the regular old 2P's bonding because it doesn't need to hybridize, okay? Because it's just going to use the same old, uh, the electrons just where they are. They don't need to hybridize between an S and a P because it's only bonding with the P orbitals. All right, and so this allows us to actually predict the geometry. So really, the two main reasons in my mind of why we need hybridization is that it allows our electrons to be, uh, it allows us to uh, reconcile the idea of the electrons being at different energy levels and then they mix to become the same energy okay so mix to become all right uh, same energy right that's the first idea and then the next idea is that it allow it still allows us to predict um, geometric shapes all right, so that's really that's the that's those are my the two main reasons that we use hybridization. Okay, and we're just going to briefly go through a couple more here. Okay, um, <clears throat> so boron, we know boron makes three bonds because he's an odd duck as well. Okay, and so he's going to make an sp two, meaning he's going to use his his s orbital here and then two p orbitals. Okay, and um, don't get confused by this. This is one s, so this is really a two s orbital, and these are uh, two p orbitals, right? So those be the x and the y. They hybridize, and you form your sp two orbitals, and they try to get as far apart from one another, and so you get this triangle, and you get this trigonal planar uh, shape, just like you're used to seeing with Vesper, all right? And so we we say it's sp2 because there's one s and two p's notice the the two goes up here as an exponent and i imagine that's because we don't like to uh, confuse the in subs in chemistry a lot of times subscripts mean uh, something a little bit different okay uh, so anyway so sp2 all right so one s two p's and then we can also have sp3 hybridization so this would be something like a ch4 or you know uh, methane something like that so this is one s and then three p orbitals and then they'll arrange themselves in that tetrahedral shape we're used to seeing which are 109.5 degrees apart from one another okay now looking back at water well what happened with water well water okay let's redraw water here at water oxygen hydrogen and then two sets of lone pairs Okay, and so uh, water, remember, has four electron domains. Remember how to calculate, ele find electron domains. We just count the number of electrons around here. So two bonds, two lone pairs. So one, two, three, four electron domains. So we know it'd be based off tetrahedral, which is always sp3 hybridization. Okay, so really you can just be like, okay, one, two, three, four. So that means I needed four orbitals. So that means I had an s and then three p's. One plus three is four. Okay, so there's your tetrahedral, and you got your oxygen, your bonding orbitals, and then your lone pair orbitals right there. And all these guys are going to be at equal energy levels. All right, now hypervalent molecules, all right, uh, hypervalent, remember, means extra electrons. Okay, so they got more than an octet. All right, so we talked about lots of examples, you know, the, the guys that make five and six uh, electron domains, right? 
Okay. Um, so in order, if we were going to continue to use hybridization, we would have to use d orbitals to make this happen. And you still see this idea floating around online, this idea of sp3d or sp3d2. Okay. Now, um, current theories say that this doesn't really occur, that hybridization with the d orbitals don't really work because it takes too much energy to promote up those d orbitals. So that's currently what uh, the current uh, experimental values, current theory suggests. So uh, that this is kind of an interesting place. That chemistry is still kind of, uh, as of the recording of this video, chemistry is still changing. Okay, um, so in order to suggest how hypervalent molecules bond, we're going to have to, you have to use a much more detailed approach. We're not going to use that in this class. Okay, so hybrid orbital summary, how do you establish what your hybridization is? First, you draw the Lewis structure, determine the electron domains, okay, and then just figure out how many you need. All right, so let's do a couple practice. This is just kind of a guideline here. If you have two electron domains, you'll be sp. If you have three electron domains, you have sp2. If you have uh, four electron domains, you'll have sp, and this should be three, sp3. All right. <clears throat> uh, we'll skip this one. Practice exercise two. Predict the electron domain geometry and hybridization of the central atom in SO32 minus. So this will be just a, a quick, easy guy here. So you got S, you got three oxygen. We're going to add those guys together. Sulfur has six. Oxygen has six. So three times six. So that's uh, 1824 electrons. Okay, but it's two minus, right? Because of that two minus, we're going to add two more electrons. So we really we get 26 electrons to work with. Sulfur is going to go in the middle because it's least electronegative, and we throw on our oxygens. Give everything a full octet. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And one, two, three, four, five, six. And then one, two. All right, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six. All right, so we had twenty-six to work with. We used twenty-six. So this is the Lewis structure for uh, sulfite. All right, SO32 minus. Now, how many? So we know for sure that this guy would be uh, trigonal pyramidal. Right, you make it a little tripod guy. That would be the Vesper theory. But really, we don't care about that. If we're figuring out hybridization, we need to know the electron domain geometry. How many electron domains do we have? Well, we're just going to count up how many electron domains are around the central atom. There's three bonds, one, uh, two, three, and then the lone pair. Right? So you got uh, four electron domains. Okay, electron domains. All right. So that means this is based off tetrahedral. And so we need four, so that means we'll have an S, and we can only ever have one S, and then we'll just have three Ps. So SP3, this would be the hybridization. All right. And now uh, we also have to talk about something else. So, um, so far we focused on Lewis structures that only have single bonds, as we talked about hybridization. Okay, so we also need to come up with an idea, well, how do double and triple bonds form? Because uh, if our hybridization occurs in order to make single bonds form, what happens to double and triple bonds? And so the idea is, is that in order to form double and triple bonds, those are going to be made with unused p orbitals. Okay, so some of the p orbitals will get used in order to make uh, the, the new hybridization, like an sp, and then you'll have, if you have sp, that means you got two extra p orbitals, right? If you make sp2, you've got one extra p orbital. And so what happens is those extra p orbitals are going to be used uh, off axes in order to form your double bonds. Okay, And so they're also referred to as a sideways overlap. And so we get two types of bonds. We get sigma bonds and pi bonds. Okay, Sigma uses this little guy here. All right, and pi uses just sim literally the pi symbol. Okay, All right, so sigma bonds are characterized by head-to-head -head overlap head-to-head -head overlap. So this is your sigma bond, okay? Notice that you've got your, your two orbitals, and so this area here, this covalent bond, that is your sigma bond, okay? And so the, the electron density is right on the internuclear axis, okay? The internuclear axis. So the, the internuclear, this is just a fancy way of saying the line that's made by connecting these two uh, nucleuses, right? And so this is where your electron density is located, right on that line. All right. Now, pi bonds are loc are uh, they have sideways overlap. Okay, and this electron density is both above and below the internuclear axis. So the internuclear axis again is that line between the two nucleuses, and your pi bond is established by these p orbitals, these unused p orbitals. Right, this would have been the uh, the p orbital right here, right, and right here, and then here, 
and here, right? This would have been your p orbital. And then you get this sharing here and here. This is your pi bond. Now, don't get confused. This is not two different pi bonds. This together is a pi bond. So you could almost imagine one electron being here and one electron being here. All right. So don't get confused that it's two pi bonds. That is one pi bond. All right. So let's look at let's look at what this actually looks like. So over here we have ethylene. Okay, so this would be ethylene has a double bond. So you got C double bond C and then H. I don't know why I drew it like this. <laughs> Whatever. All right, so that's your ethylene. So you've got uh, you, you got a double bond to your carbon. Okay, so here you've got your sigma bond, and sigma bonds are your single bonds. So this is your sigma sigma bond right here. Okay, and then <clears throat> so this guy here, it's got three electron domains. So that means he's sp2 hybridized. Both of these carbons are sp2 hybridized, and so that's what these purple ones are here. This one, this one, and this one. That's your sp2 hybrids. Now the pink guys here, those are your unhybridized p orbitals. Okay, because it's sp2, we have one s, and then we have three p orbitals available, but we only use two for hybridization. So there's one left over. Okay. Now this leftover one is this p orbital that sticks up and below uh, the axes here. All right, and so the carbons to the, each other will form a sigma bond. So that's what formed from the sp2 orbitals. Okay, the other two sp2 orbital orbitals will be attached to these these hydrogens right there and there and there. Okay, and then the pi bond or this double bond will get formed by these unused uh, p orbitals. Right, they'll they'll form from here to here and from here to here that's and that's really where your double bond occurs okay so you can see why this guy here is stronger okay a double bond is stronger than a single bond because a single bond is just your sigma bond but your double bond is really another couple of bonds on top of it right now because one thing to get confused uh, don't get confused about is that your sigma bond is all if you just had the energy of a sigma bond by itself a sigma bond by itself will always be stronger than a pi bond by itself by a long shot but once you have a double or a triple bond you have a sigma bond in, with in addition to pi bonds okay so anyway um, <clears throat> so this is a good rule of thumb single bonds are always sigma bonds multiple bonds have one sigma bond and any other of the bonds are pi bonds okay so th this was uh, your ethylene here on the side and then we have also have ethylene which is also um, yeah so you see so you have uh, so you have your carbon triple bonded to a carbon here acetylene that's the name acetylene all right so again so what's the hybridization on this this carbon? Well, it's got two electron domains, so that's sp. Same with this carbon, that guy's sp. So you've got your two lobes for your hybridization, and you get the sigma bond that forms right there. All right, but then you've got two unhybridized 2p orbitals, right? So that's the pink one. You got uh, one that goes up and down, and one that comes in and out of the plane. All right. Again, your hydrogens are going to be sigma bond. Okay. To your to your sp on the other side, and then you've got your triple bond is formed by the same as the double bond. So we've got the same thing as over here, where you got the the double bond is up, below, above, and below. But then you've got a secondary, another uh, pi bond, right, that comes in front of the screen and behind the screen. And so there's your triple bond that gets formed, and you can see well, obviously this would be even stronger because it's another set of pi bonds. All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. So predict the bond angles around each carbon in acetonitrile. Okay. Uh, so with bond angles, so this is sp3. So this guy should be uh, 109.5 degrees between each of these these carbons. Um, and then from here to here, well, this would be uh, linear. So this would be 180 degrees. All right. Uh, describe hybridization at each carbon atom. So this carbon would be sp3, okay, and this carbon would be sp. Determine the number of sigma and pi bonds in the molecule. All right, uh, so sigma bonds are any bonds, right? One, two, three, four, five. So we got uh, five sigmas. And then pi bonds, remember, uh, pi bonds only occur in double and triple bonds. So you've got a triple bond here, so that means you got two pi bonds. All right, two pi bonds. Okay, pretty easy stuff. <clears throat> Last little bit here is the idea of localized versus delocalized electrons. Okay, localized electrons are any bonding electrons that are specifically shared be only between only two atoms. 
okay so specifically shared so these are bonding electrons that are only shared between two electrons okay now we talked about you think back to chapter eight when we talked about uh, formal charges we talked about resonance structures remember we talked about resonance structures how those double bonds could be in more than one place at the same time and they can be you know you could have this uh, this hybrid orbital uh, this hybrid structure of this new thing okay now these electrons that get shared via resonance okay all right are called delocalized electrons okay so they're still bonding electrons but but they're being delocalized meaning they're not just between two things they could be between several different things all at once okay benzene here is the quintessential example of this so remember before we talked about benzene is a, a six member carbon ring right where each point is is a carbon and you got your hydrogen sticking off and then you've got double bonds between all three of them so that's kind of essentially what they're showing here you've got those pi bonds sticking up those are your double bonds and we know via resonance that this structure and this structure here are equally likely right both of these benzene rings right so you got both of these so via resonance this kind of makes remember and we I looked at this guy where you get your double bond is kind of shared between all three of those so a lot of times you'll see this also drawn with just a ring around the middle like that that's also a benzene you got your benzene with your your circle right around your your six member ring right there as well all right so anyway so you got your your double bond and so because these guys these double bonds are not stuck between just two they, these double bonds could be anywhere around this ring these electrons are delocalized all right so these are delocalized pi electrons or pi bonds all right <clears throat> so it says how many electrons are in the pi system of the ozone molecule all right oh here's another example so you've got uh so this would be this is no3 i just want to i threw this guy in here because so no3 uh looks like this where you've got a double bond and i'm just, i'm not going to draw in all the lone pairs and then you can imagine that these these double bonds uh could be here or here so you end up with a, a hybrid structure where you've got your o's and then you got up you got your double bond kind of all around it right oops i forgot that last oxygen and so your your sigma bonds are always localized but your pi bond here are delocalized all right so ozone is the same kind of idea if we were going to draw ozone out it would look like this right and we could have another resonance structure where we get it like this as well Okay, and so so how many pi electrons are in, or how many uh, electrons are in the pi system? Well, there's one pi bond, right? It's delocalized, but there's only one pi bond, and so there's only two uh, pi electrons here. All right. Now let's do a couple of these real quick. How many of these species have delocalized bonding? Well, we did SO three two minus before, so we'll just uh, draw that guy out again. SO three, right? Two minus, and I'm not going to draw any of these lone pairs. Oh, I guess I will draw these lone pairs. I didn't want to, but then you convinced me to. So here we go: one, two, three, four, five, six. So anyway, so uh, there's no delocalized bonding. But number one, there's no pi bonds at all, so you can't have any delocalized. So that makes it easy. So so this guy can't have any uh, delocalized electrons. Let's try SO2. All right, we I don't have room for all these, so we're only going to do a couple. So we go. Uh, SO2. So let's see. So we got uh, sulfur and two oxygens. We're going to add those guys up. So that'd be two times six plus six. So that's 18 electrons. All right. So we go S, O, O, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right. So uh, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So we're going to have to have a little, uh, double bond in here so we'll erase that one we'll erase this one and then so we'll have this guy like this and you can see that we now we have a pi bond and you you know now that there's resonance here so this guy could have a delocalized bonding right because this pi bond could be here or it could be up here all right let's try um oh oh let's just try so3 as good as any of the other so it's just six more i'm not going to do all the math again it's just 24 electrons so we got s yeah s and then o o o it's magic 
I don't know if anybody ever watches these. I might as well crack myself up. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. Okay, so we got two too many electrons, so we're going to erase two of them. All right, and then we'll have, oops, I've got to change my pen. All right, and so we'll have a double bond here. And Bob's your uncle. So this guy, you could have a resin structure. This would be trigonal planar, right? And so you'd have resin structure where this double bond could be in here. So this would have delocalized electrons. All right. Oh, let's just do H2CO as well because it's a it's a good example. All right, <clears throat> of a of a localized pi bond. Okay. So H2. Uh, so we have uh, two hydrogens, carbon and oxygen. Okay. We're gonna add those guys up. All right. So we got uh, two plus twelve six plus what the heck plus four plus six right so six twelve twelve electrons here so you get carbon oxygen and the two hydrogen sticking off and i'm already showing my cards here a little bit i know what's going to happen so one two three four five six and then one two and then we have uh, two four six eight ten twelve fourteen two too many electrons all right two too many electrons so we're going to erase these guys here we're going to pointer options pen and so oh did I erase it I erased an extra one and so we need a double bond here all right so two four six eight ten twelve electrons okay so this guy's got three sigma bonds right and one pi bond now we know that hydrogen can't ever have a double bond it's only ever going to make a one bond so that tells us that this uh, pi bond here cannot be delocalized it's not going to be moved around so this is your pi bond right there. And really, that's about it, right? So um, so it has, although it has pi bonding, it's not localized, right? Or it's not delocalized. It is localized. So therefore, this doesn't uh, fit the example here either. All right. Um, and so that's it for this video. We talked about a lot of stuff. Make sure you do your, you do those practice and let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you on the flip side.